the Certified Kubernetes Security Specialist, the CKS exam, is getting some important updates. So these changes aim to make sure that the certified professionals have the latest skills to secure Kubernetes environments effectively. In this video, we'll break down the updates for each domain, starting with the cluster setup domain and moving through the rest to understand what's new and what it means for you. My name is Mumshad Manambath and welcome to CodeCloud. Now, to start with, the cluster setup domain will see its weight increase from 10% to 15%. So previously, this domain included configuring network security policies to restrict cluster level access, using the CIS benchmarks to review the security configurations of key Kubernetes components, such as the etcd, the kubelet, kubedns, and kubeapi, and properly setting up ingress objects with security controls. Now, in the updated curriculum, many of these principles remain, but there are notable changes. While the focus on using network security policies and CIS benchmarks continue, there is now now, a specific emphasis on setting up ingress with TLS. So TLS, as you probably already know, is crucial for encrypting data in transit. Now, the curriculum also maintains the importance of protecting node metadata and endpoints and verifying platform binaries before deployment. However, it no longer includes the guideline to minimize the use and access to GUI elements. So basically, we're shifting towards more specific actionable security measures rather than general kind of best practices. Now, the next one is the cluster hardening domain. So in in the CKS exam, it focuses on implementing strong security measures to protect Kubernetes clusters from potential threats. Now, this domain remains critical and with its weight unchanged, so it remains at 15%. There are no major changes here. So this domain includes four main practices. So the first one stresses the importance of restricting access to the Kubernetes API, uh, the use of role-based access control to minimize exposure, the need to exercise caution when using service accounts, and finally updating Kubernetes frequently to avoid vulnerabilities. So this section has remained largely the same, and I don't see any major changes here. Now moving on to the next domain, which is the system hardening domain. This focuses on reducing the attack surface of the Kubernetes environment by implementing various security measures at the system level. Now this domain has seen a reduction in its weight, from 15 to 10% in the updated curriculum, and the core principles remain the same. So first, it highlights the importance of minimizing the host operating system footprint to reduce the attack surface. This involves stripping down the OS to its essential components, removing unnecessary packages and services that could be exploited by attackers. Another key practice was minimizing IAM, or identity and access management rules. So this means ensuring that users and services have the least privilege necessary to perform their functions. By limiting permissions, you reduce the potential damage that could be done if an account is compromised. And the next one is minimizing external access to networks. So by restricting network access, you can prevent unauthorized entities from reaching your Kubernetes cluster, thereby reducing the risk of external attacks. And finally, the appropriate use of kernel hardening tools like AppArmor and SecComp is emphasized. And these tools help secure kernel by enforcing security policies that restrict the capabilities of processes, and thus by protecting system from various types of attacks. So in this domain, I think the only change is the refinement of the practice of minimizing IAM roles to using least privileged identity and access management, which kind of is the same. So it involves granting only permissions that are absolutely necessary for a user or service to perform its function and no more. And I don't think that there's any major changes here. So the next one is the domain on minimizing microservice vulnerability. So this remains at 20% weightage. However, the updated curriculum does include some changes. So previously, the domain emphasized setting up appropriate OS level security domains, managing Kubernetes secrets, using container runtime sandboxes in multi-tenant environments, and implementing pod-to-pod encryption using mutual TLS or MTLS. So these practices focus on ensuring that microservices were isolated, secure, and could communicate safely. Now, in the updated curriculum, there are a few changes. So first, the focus has shifted from setting up OS-level security domains to using appropriate pod security standards. So security standards define policies that restrict what can do, ensuring they operate with the least uh, privilege necessary. Second, uh, while maintaining Kubernetes secrets remains critical, the recommendation to use container runtime sandboxes has been broadened to understanding and implementing isolation techniques. This includes multi-tenancy and sandbox containers, but also encompasses other methods to enhance isolation. And third, the practice of implementing pod-to-pod -pod encryption has been updated to specifically using Cilium. So Cilium is an advanced networking and security tool that provides robust policies and encryption capabilities. So by using Cilium, administrators can ensure that communication between pods is encrypted and secure. 
Now, moving on to the supply chain security domain, this domain aims to protect the entire lifecycle of software components within the Kubernetes environments. So the weight here remains the same as before at 20%, uh, but there are a few changes that can be seen here. So this domain covered practices like minimizing the basic image footprint to reduce potential vulnerabilities, securing the supply chain by whitelisting allowed registries, signing and validating images, using static analysis tools to inspect user workloads such as Kubernetes resources and Docker files and scanning image for known vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities. As new tools and solutions have emerged in the past few years within the CNCF ecosystem, the curriculum has been updated to use some of the projects in the ecosystem. For example, one significant addition is the focus on understanding the supply chain, which includes the Software Bill of Materials, or SBOM, uh, CICD processes and artifact repositories. So an SBOM, if you haven't heard of it before, provides a detailed list of all components within a software product, including open source libraries and dependencies. And this will help in identifying and addressing vulnerabilities in third party components. Now, knowing exactly what components are in your software allows for better vulnerability management and compliance with security policies. Another important update is the use of specific tools for static analysis, such as KubeSec and KubeLinter. So KubeSec evaluates Kubernetes resource configurations to ensure they follow security best practices, while KubeLinter analyzes Kubernetes YAML files and Helm charts to identify potential security issues. So these tools provide advanced capabilities for detecting and addressing security vulnerabilities early in the development process. And finally, the last domain on monitoring, logging, and runtime security focuses on maintaining the security and integrity of uh, Kubernetes environments through comprehensive monitoring and logging practices. So this domain, again, retains Retains its weight at 20% and has been updated to streamline and focus on the most crucial aspects of runtime security. So this domain covers several critical areas such as performing behavioral analytics of system calls, processes, and file activities at both the host and the container levels to detect malicious activities, detecting threats within physical infrastructure, applications, networks, data users, and workloads, and detecting all phases of attack regardless of where it occurred and how it spread. And then performing deep analytical investigations to identify bad actors within the environment, ensuring the immunity of containers at one time and using audit logs to monitor access. Now, other than rewording a few topics and combining them, I don't see any major changes in this area as well. So those are some of the major changes that's going to happen with the CKS exam in September 2024. Again, I feel like looking at the changes, I feel like 80-85% is the same. So if you have been preparing for the CKS exam for the past few months, there's no need to stop or no need to worry. There are no major changes happening. However, there are some changes in separate domains and sections that are happening. And uh, we will be updating the course on CodeCloud for CKS to match with these updates. But again, I feel like 80, 80 percent of it is the same. So there may be about 20 percent of topics that may need to be learned new, a couple of tools that may need to be practiced with. So this update applies to all scheduled exams, regardless of when the reservation was made or when the exam was purchased. Now, another important update is that there is an immediate change in the prerequisite requirements for scheduling the CKS exam. So candidates no longer need to have an active CKA certification. Instead, if it is sufficient to have achieved the CKA certification at any point in the past, even if it is currently expired. So this change simplifies the process for candidates to qualify for the exam. So what that means is currently, as of this recording, CKA certificates are valid for two years and then they expire after two years. And then you got to retake the CKA exam to renew the CKA certification. But now we know that CKS has a prerequisite that you must have a CKA certification. So you just need to have passed the CKA certification you don't necessarily need to have an active CKA certification. So if you did your CKA three years back, you don't need to renew it. You could just go directly for the CKS uh, exam. And just so you know, we are in the process of updating the curriculum of our CKS course on CodeCloud with the latest changes in the exam. And these will be ready by the time the exam is updated. So be sure to check it out. Uh, the course covers all the topics required for the exam, some prerequisites to understand concepts and a set of mock exams to prepare you for it. So use the link given in the description to access the course. And of course, when you complete your certification, do not forget to reach out to us and let us know on social media of good news. So all the best to your exams, and I'm sure you'll pass with flying colors. That's all for now. Goodbye.